He's going to hit you with some real talk. So if your feet get stepped on and you leave out of here with your feelings hurt, you have only yourself to blame. Pick your feet up off the floor and don't get your feelings hurt. Because if you listen with an open mind and an open heart, it will probably make a lot of sense. This man's been through it all. He survived not only one tower coming down his head, but two towers coming down his head. Some of us look at a house fire and think, wow, that's a big deal. This guy was the biggest rescue operation the world has ever seen. And he lived to tell his story. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, my good friend, fellow instructor, Philip Claremore from Ladder Company 140, FDNY Retired. Everyday guy, just like you and I, just you know, just an old blue collar guy, but from the past, the same way we do, came on a lot of some background. And as Jerry said, I want to tell you my story. It's no special than your story, your story, her story, or her story. I'm just an average guy. I just either be in the right place at the wrong time, or you may say I was in the wrong place at the right time, or right place at the right time. However, you look at it after you heard my story today. So before we get started, or rather, say, let's go ahead and get started, and <clears throat> let's talk about the job. I'm going to tell you about my FDNY New York City Fire Department experience. I'm going to tell you about what I'm doing now, which you don't work for Box 1971. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I am and what my job is. Now let's talk about the job. The job of being a firefighter, whether you're a Toronto firefighter, New York City firefighter, Montgomery, Alabama firefighter, paid, volunteer, career, small town, big city, rural, volunteer, it doesn't matter. The job is the same wherever you go. Fires are not burning hotter in New York City than they do in Toronto. The danger for you as a firefighter in Toronto is less, no less, than it is for a guy in Boston. So let's talk about what this job is about. But before we can talk about what the job is about, let's talk about what the job is not about. Now here's where I may step on some toes, and also, by the way, if I did order today's step on some toes, I do apologize. We're still friends, we're still adults. We go have a cigar and a beverage later together. What's this job about? And what does 9 11 mean to you? What 9 11 means to me, having lived through it, is I witnessed. First hand, first hand, in an instant, not over a period of six days, six months, but an instant, a matter of less than one hour, I have witnessed over 3,000 human beings lose their life. Nearly 10% of those were my brothers and sisters from the FDMI. People I had eaten meals with, people that I had called down hallways with. What does 9 11 mean to you? We're coming up on the 20 year anniversary, roughly one month from today. And I want you, when you leave here tonight, between now and then, the 11th of September 2021, think about what does it mean? So, what does this mean? Of course, we know it's one of the biggest disasters in American history as far as loss of life. Second, or rather, I should say, the previous biggest incident like this where we lost so many lives was Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. What does 9 11 mean to you? Is it a tattoo? Is it a t shirt? Is it a snappy bumper sticker, ball cap, a flag in your yard? Who were the people 9 11? I don't mean the people who caused it happen, flew two airplanes into high rise buildings. Who were the people involved after the facts? Meaning, who was profoundly affected? by 9-11, and I want you, when you leave here tonight, ask yourself, what does this mean to me as an American citizen? Particularly you younger folks who don't remember 9-11, because either you were born, or we're just too long, young to remember today. And for those of you who are, who are young, who don't remember 9-11, who are born after the fact, I assure you that there's somewhere, in your, some aspect of your life, economical, social, 
crime related. We have police officers in here. You know, how we look at criminals, how we live our lives in, in respect to their identity of victim. How does 9 11 relate to you? And when you younger folks, you may not even realize that this event has had an impact on your life. So, what does this job mean? What's this job about? What does this job mean? What's this job about? Before I can tell you what this job is about, I can tell you what this job is not about. So what does this stuff here mean? The job is not about fancy schmancy emblems. The job is not about decals on your bumper, decals on the back window of your pickup truck, and on t-shirts. The thin red line, I don't even know what that means. To be quite honest with you, I worked in New York, <clears throat> retired from New York, moved down to North Carolina, and I got back, when I got down to North Carolina, I saw everybody said this little red line, and I've been in North Carolina, having left New York City in December of 05. I've been down there for almost 16 years now, and still someone, no one has yet told me what that little means. Everybody's got it on their car, their t shirt, no bubble, etc. If you think that this job is nothing more than a cute emblem that you want the people to see, then you have the wrong impression about what this job is about. I've had some firefighters in North Carolina tell me, oh, I love that thin red line on my pickup truck, my front bumper, my license plate, the back window of my car, because it gets me out of traffic tickets. Well, because if a firefighter sees that red line in the back of my window, he will, you know, if the police officer sees it, he will pull me over. Or maybe when he's approaching the car and asks me to roll down the window, he'll have to just see it, he'll think twice. Oh, this guy's a brother fireman. I won't give him a ticket from 175 to 35. If that's what you think this job's all about, getting free meals, getting free coffee in the diner, getting, you know, 50% discount at the local McDonald's, getting out of traffic tickets, or being recognized by grades. If you think that's what this job about, is about, or rather to say, if you are on the job so that you can get something out of the job, then you don't know what this job's about. Professional image. The job is not about t-shirts. Do I own fire t-shirts? Yes, I do. It's extremely rare to wear. Think about who you are and what you represent. Hundreds of years of the fire service in this country and what you represent. I get sick and tired of t-shirts. The truth of the matter is I'm tall all up and down the East Coast, 29 years in the fire service, and the majority of the people, what we call t-shirt firefighters, is, is all they are. You've got the image, you've got the look, you got the logo on your shirt that says, a fireman. But do you have the skills to back it up? Don't be a t-shirt fireman, folks. And if you are going to wear a firefighter t-shirt, and I'm very, very happy today to, 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 to say that over the last few days I've been here in Toronto, the t-shirts that, that I have seen have been very professional. Very clean and very professional. I want to thank you. You folks in this small town are outstanding representative of what the American Fire Service is really all about, or at least what it should be. Thank you. Stupid expressions. Some of these expressions are actually degrading to the public that we serve. I saw a pair of t shirt that says, I'm not here to kiss your ass, I'm here to stay. It's kind of said it's degrading. These people pay your salary if you're a paid firefighter. If you're a volunteer firefighter, who do you think provides the equipment around right here? Who pays this electricity bill? Who puts oil in the fuel in the truck? That person. Do not support that person. They pay your salary. Okay? You don't see plumbers walking around with shirts like this, do you? Hey, I'm a plumber. My name's Bob. I just plugged your the biggest poop out of a toilet last week. I want you to go up on this t shirt. This says on the back of my shirt. You know what I mean? You don't see doctors doing this, do you? You don't see plumbers and doctors putting, I'm a doctor, on the back of the car. Plumbers don't wear t shirts. Doctors don't have to have such a doctor's in the car, do they? Alright, so why do we do it? Act professional. The salty look. It's another one burns me up. 29 years in the fire service. I've never loved to help them. I've never blackened or burned any yellow tetany drums on my leather helmet. I've never melted any more guy shoes. You show me a firefighter who's done that, 
Are you going to tell you an idiot? You just have the common sense to crawl and you have to blow the fire? Who's going to maybe perhaps go into an area, in an area he doesn't even belong in? The fire is that very intense. Why are you in there? Or at least have the common sense to crawl and not stand up and walk around, John. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we used to see guys you do stupid stuff like this in New York. Very rare guys up there act like this. But if you saw a guy in a helmet that's all melted and burned or crispy like that, he used to walk into the guy, like go next to his ear and go, Oh my god, that's amazing. The guy go, What? That doctor did what the hell of a job with your burn wraps. What are you talking about? Because I know you just spent six weeks in burn, sir. I know your head was not in that helmet. But if your head is that helmet, why are you not walking around with third degree burn scars on your face? If you don't have enough decency to take care of your equipment, why are you on the job? We have two police officers here, at least there might be more officers, all two of them. These guys don't walk around with rusty guns, do they? They don't think she's my lady, ladies and children. I'm a badass because my guns are rusty, right? Am I wrong? Do you lubricate your gun at least once a week or I don't know how often? You, you do maintenance on your on your sidearm. You do. You take care of your equipment. And you're concerned about your professional image. Okay? If I see a police officer on the streets of Toronto or my hometown in Thomasville, North Carolina, where I'm currently residing, and he's got a rusty gun, I'm thinking this guy doesn't even give a shit about himself. You know what I mean? If you don't give a shit enough about taking your care of your equipment, how do I know that you give a crap about me, the citizen? Right? Got a saucy image. Hang in with the boys. Don't get me wrong, I'm gonna hang with the boys tonight. I am. There's no doubt about it. It's what we do when we're teaching fire classes or taking fire classes around town. We're gonna hang with the boys. However, unfortunately, so many members of the fire service think that that's what the fire service is, no more, no less. Well, I'm just here to hang with the boys. I got the salty image. I've got the t-shirt. I got the sweatshirt. I got the tattoo. And I'm having a blast here. But when that thing goes, <laughs> well, gotta go in. I'll see you. Little grandma's house. These are the kinds of guys who love hanging out with the boys. They love hanging with the boys. They don't like getting on the BRT, big red truck. They love hanging with the boys. Anytime there's a free meal in the firehouse. Some type of social function of the firehouse, they're the first ones to show up. They're not the first ones to show up at 2 o'clock in the morning. For a routine fire alarm, or when the 80 year old grandmother fell and broke her head in her kitchen, they're usually nowhere to be found. Hanging with the boys. Take a, take a look at the picture of the left. I used to work in a fire department in North Carolina. About the same time I met Jeremy. We had those same beautiful leather recliners. Depending on where you buy them, they're, they're from $700 to $1,000 on the recliners. But it was one of those fire departments where this spends one, two, three, four, five, six, six hundred, excuse me, six thousand dollars worth of leather chairs, and the fire chief wouldn't spend four ninety five for an elevator key. Why well, ain't got the money? Chief, it's four ninety five. I ain't got no money. She got thousand uh six thousand dollars worth of chairs there and the people can lay around. If you've got time to lay around, you got time to open the book and study. If your fire chief is spending more money on luxury so you can hang with the boys, then he or she has his or her priorities wrong. Adult beverages, I love adult beverages. I do. Unfortunately, when I was in the New York City Fire Department, FDNY, I saw some guys drink from job. It's a New York City fire department tradition. Doesn't make it right, though, does it? Doesn't make it right. You need to be on your game to be prepared to fight fire at all times. Don't be drinking in the firehouse. Don't do that. Take care of your body. Act professional. Look professional. Smell professional. You don't need to go to someone's house on a routine fire alarm. You pull up, the lady opens the door, and you go, Hi, I'm Hal Huffman from the local fire department. She goes, Oh my God. You read. It's more like a brewery. You back to your truck and get out of here. You know what I mean? What is the job, however? I just told you what the job is not. This job is blue collar work. It's simple. 
We use tools. We use hoses. We use our backs. We are blue-collar laborers. If there's some people in here who are white-collar, don't be them. But they do, by all means. But let's face it, the majority of the work done in this country is done by people for other people. It's the blue-collar work that makes the country go round and round the world's been, right? Simple, blue-collar work. Look what's going on with these two pictures here. Great pictures. Both these pictures are the New York City Fire Department. We have one that appears to be a tenement fire on the left. A store on the right with fire extension to the floor to the, the apartment above. We're looking at men and women in these photographs who are physically suffering. Those of you who have crawled down a hallway, stretched a line, forced a door, cut a roof hole, you know that firefighting people often refer to us as occupational athletes. Firefighting is painful if you're doing it right. If you're doing it right, you're suffering exhaustion, your heart rate's 170, your blood pressure's 170 over 110, you're breathing 30 times a minute, your muscles, your muscles, your joints are aching, and your skin may be burning. So these are people who are experiencing physical suffering in this photograph from people they don't even know. That's what this job's all about. Putting your life on the line, willing to sacrifice your body, whether it be burns, sprains, strains, fractures, for somebody else you don't even know. That's what this job's about. And then when it's all said and done, you go back to the firehouse, you finish your shift, you take a shower, you go home. If you don't go down to Joe's pub in the morning, brag about it. I rescued a baby last night. No, you didn't. Risking it all for people we don't even know. Risking it all for people we don't even know. Now, a small town like this, no insult intended. I understand that this town has fewer than 6,000 people in here. That makes this job even more special for you because chances are you do know these people. You do know these people. And your reputation is on the line. So if you guys screw up and don't give 100% on a given incident, it's not just, hey, the firefighters in Toronto, the fire department screwed up. It's Bob screwed up. Janet, she's my neighbor, she's a firefighter in Toronto. Janet's from there. So it means more to you than you for someone like myself. Loving your fellow man, being willing to crawl down that hallway with no guarantee that you're going to crawl back down that hallway. Being willing to get in your car as a volunteer, respond to someone's house you don't even know, not knowing you want to come home. Why? For love. If you don't think that this job is about compassion, empathy, sympathy, and love, then you don't know what this job is about. It's not about belt buckles, t shirts, bumper stickers, the salty image, tattoos. It's about loving your fellow man and showing him or her through your actions, even the action of what we in the fire service call the ultimate sacrifice. A little bit about myself. I haven't always been a New York City firefighter. Uh, I grew up in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Winston-Salem is a uh, city of about uh, 275,000 people. And I uh, know it's all to you folks, but to me, I think Winston-Salem is a small town. But I come from a small town. Graduated from high school, went to college, earned two uh, college degrees, and started working as a paramedic while I was down there in North Carolina. Joined the fire service in 1992 as a 17-year-old volunteer firefighter. Got my EMT certification in 1994, got my paramedic certification in 1996, and was riding an ambulance in North Carolina as a medic before I moved to New York City in 1997. I had a dream. I was a simple, uneducated, small-town boy 
North Carolina. A stupid kid in a stupid dream. Kind of like the movie Booty. You know? Shut up. They made a movie about Rudy. They didn't make a movie about me. Here I was, a stupid kid who had a dream. And I pursued it. And the Lord was willing to bless me. That's why I say I know better than you. So the past the same way you do. I just worked hard. My prayers were answered. And I became a New York City firefighter. I became a New York City firefighter in the year 2000. I had moved to New York City in 1997 and was hired in April 1998 and had the pleasure of working as a paramedic in the borough of Manhattan. I worked on the Lower East Side. I worked up in Harlem, Alphabet City, some of the toughest neighborhoods in Manhattan as a medic. And then they sent me to the Bronx. I was worried, nervous, didn't know anything about the Bronx. Got out of the Bronx, I loved it. Worked out of Jacoby Medical Center, which is the North Bronx. Absolutely loved it. I don't know if, if, if any of you have ever worked in EMS. A lot of people say EMS means whatever it means to you. One of the things I've heard people say is that EMS stands for every minute sucks. EMS is a tough job. New York City EMS runs over 1.2 million, at least that's what they ran when I was there, over 1.2 million EMS calls a year. That's roughly 4,000 a day. And that is includes voluntary hospitals and the private health companies. That's just the FDNY EMS. What I understand is that since COVID, there was like 2 million calls per year. Every minute sucked. But I wanted to be a New York City firefighter. And I had to do what I had to do. To become a fire in New York City, even if that meant driving the gun bus. I run the gun bus. Proby School. I graduated from FDNY Proby School Probationary Firefighter Academy December 2nd of the year 2000. I became a New York City firefighter. Does anyone know the gentleman on the right? What is his name? Thomas Von Essen. Thomas Von Essen was the union president, Uniform Firefighter Association, rose up through the ranks as a firefighter, working in 42 truck, the South Bronx, became the union boss, and later became the fire commissioner. And he was the fire commissioner on 9 11. The gentleman on my left here, his name is Pete Hansey. Pete's, uh, Pete's son was a good friend of mine. We were in uh, medical school together, and we were in FDMI Focus School together. And Pete Hansey, the son, the third, ended up going to Ladder Company 111. Well, when your father is the chief of the department, you can pretty much go to whatever fire you want to. Now, why wouldn't you pick a good company like 111 Truck? Pete Hansey was cut in half from 911. When the second tower came down, I had spoken with Pete Gancy less than a half hour before he was killed. After graduating from Proby School, I was assigned to what the city of New York Fire Department refers to as the Borrow of Fire. Engine Company 280. It's in one of the toughest ghettos in Brooklyn. Company runs about, what is it, Jeremy? About 50, 53, 5,400 runs a year. FDNY has over 200 engine companies. 280 engines ranked in the top 25. Very prestigious fire company. Jeremy calls me the midge, and as you can see from the previous picture, I was a tiny guy. I weighed 140 pounds when I graduated from Ruby School. 140 pounds. There were 143, uh, there were 143 people in my rookie school class. I was 141. There was only two people in my class in all of me. Even the two women in my class were larger than me. But despite being one of the smallest guys in the class, graduated third in my class. Because I wasn't a good guy. Got assigned a 280 engine in the borough of fire, had a blast. Here I was, I'm excited, I'm a big 25 year old kid, 26 year old kid, whatever it was, and I'm, I'm finally doing it. I've got my dream come true. I'm going to fires. Let's talk about the Trade Center. 
Let's talk a little bit less about myself. World Trade Center. Let me see here. There we go. Lower Manhattan was economically, uh, how do you want to say this, Jeremy? The low, it was economically depressed. That area was where they ended up building the road trace. And I believe they started building it around 1969, 1970, by 1973, 74. It was complete. It was mostly TV repair shops down there. Teach you the radio repair shops. Well, back in the day, where they had iPads and iPods and cell phones, they actually had to dial in radio. Okay? So therefore, they called that area Radio Road. It was all radio repair shops. It was pretty slummy, pretty sleazy down there. So build the World Trade Center was the city and state of New York and the state of New Jersey's attempt to revitalize the economics in the area. What you're seeing here is the uh, building of World Trade Center in the late 60s and early 70s. And this, this film also is a great film so you get an idea of how tall these things were. Also gives you an idea of how they were erected. How they were struck, what were they made out of? Which may also, if you know anything about building construction for the fire service, you can not get how and why they collapsed. What you're seeing here on the left is the Hudson River. That obviously the, the tower on the left is number one World Trade Center, the North Tower. The tower on the right, halfway built, is number two World Trade Center, the South Tower. So September 11, 2001, any of you may not know, was not the first time that terrorists had attempted to destroy those buildings. The first documented case was February 26. 1993, and at the time I had less than a year in the fire service. I was a volunteer firefighter, and I used to go right up to New York City. I met some guys up there when I was in high school. Engine Company 40, 131 Amsterdam Avenue, New York, New York, 10019. Lincoln Center, Amsterdam Avenue, West 66th Street. So I used to go up and ride with these guys in the summertime. Good dudes. I really want to be like this guy. I really want to be an interesting firefighter. And I had the pleasure, well, I should say displeasure, of actually seeing World Trade Center before the 93 bombing and then went up there on a high school trip in um, May of 93 after the bombing. We got to see the devastation. During this incident, terrorists had invented a delivery type van, drove it down under the World Trade Center, as you see on the graphic to the left. I want to say it was seven or eight stories down, the parking garage down there. And their plan was to blow up the World Trade Center, have these buildings collapse laterally, and take out other buildings. They were unsuccessful. However, they did manage to kill seven people. Not just two buildings. People say the towers. People always are saying the towers, the towers, the towers. It's the trade center. There were actually seven buildings. Seven buildings. And the majority of those seven buildings were high rise. Seven buildings made up the World Trade Center. So, September 11, 2001, it wasn't just two towers that were lost, it was all seven buildings and several of the neighboring buildings that were lost. So, if you can see from the picture here, number one World Trade Center, two World Trade Centers, the South Tower. There were three World Trade Centers in the hotel between the two of them, and clockwise, counterclockwise, four, five, six, seven. Number seven World Trade Center was the last of the buildings that collapsed, and it collapsed after lunch on the day of 9 11. Not just uh, seven buildings, but an underground parking uh, garage, a wonderful, wonderful underground shopping mall. Story shopping mall, parking garages, subway, New York City subway system train stations, and a train station for the PATH trains, PATH, PATHs, Port Authority Trans Hudson. These buildings 
out over 50,000 people. These seven buildings housed over 50,000 people when the buildings were fully occupied. People lived in as far away as Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware, and Connecticut, and would take trains all the way to the World Trade Center every morning. So as you can see from the slide, and as Ben suggested earlier, please don't kill them. That's my PowerPoint. I'm not going to read the slide. Maybe you can read it yourself. One of the things that made this place such a big target, well, first of all, it's a big target because of world trade. These terrorists weren't stupid. They wanted to economically impact the entire world, and they did. But also, if you read the slide, you'll see that there were a lot of government entities, including the CIA, the FBI, the Secret Service, and various other financial, government financial institutions were there. IRS, for example, military, the New York City Office of Emergency Management, was there one of those ones? I think it was number seven. So think about it. Not only are they having a major impact on the world economy, but look what they're doing to government entities. The towers themselves were beautiful. As I said before, they were completed somewhere around 1971, 72. The construction began somewhere around 1969. These places were absolutely beautiful. A long way to top if you want to rock and roll, says ACDC. It's also a long way to top if you want to find these suckers. <laughs> Roughly 1,350 feet for both buildings. 1,350 feet. So when you see documentary films on the History Channel, the Marty Channel, the Discovery Channel, on YouTube, wherever you look at your history, you see people falling out of the sky, falling from these buildings. Thing. Some of these people are literally falling one quarter of a mile. One quarter of a mile. A human being fell from the sky. In fact, hundreds of them fell from the sky on the morning of 9 11. Number two World Trade Center was slightly smaller than number one World Trade Center. I don't know if you can see this light is not that great here, but there's actually an idiot who climbed. Free climb, no harnesses, no ropes, no carabiners, just a chalk bag, free climb, World Trade Center Towers. Needless to say, when he got to the top, he was arrested. This guy, you may call him an idiot as well, but actually, believe it or not, I actually admire this guy. There was a movie that came out about five years ago called The Walk. The Walk was written about this guy's, well, he called it his coup, or le coup. Where's, where's, where's my bridge man? Am I saying that right? Down uh, here? Yeah. I'm breaking your, I'm breaking your jobs. The coup. Philippe Petit. The movie was called The Walk. If you've never seen the movie, please get a copy of this movie. It's outstanding. Because the movie, in my opinion, not only you know shows you what he went through, the amazing feat that this guy went through in stretching a tightrope across those buildings, suspended over a quarter of a mile above the streets. Between two buildings that are actually swaying. A lot of people don't realize that the World Trade Center, each of the two towers, rather, would sway six feet either way. They were designed to do that, so they wouldn't snap the wind. And they said that if you're up like the 110th floor, the very top, when it's in one of its sways, that the toilet water would be on the side of the wall. So, Philippe Petit, August 7th. 1974, two months before I was born, completed his coup and walked between the tight ropes. Walked the road, the rock and wire right between the two World Trade Center buildings. Watch the movie, it'll give you an idea not just about what Philippe Petit did, but it gives you an idea of what those buildings look like, how glorious, how magnificent, how beautiful the place was, what they look like on the inside, what they look like on the outside, in the distance. What do they look like up above, looking down? What do they look like directly below them, looking up? They were absolutely beautiful, but absolutely, I hate this term, ginormous. Each building, 110 stories high, 1,350 feet high, 250 by 250. Big buildings. Watch that movie, you'll really enjoy it. And there's Philippe, 
So if you think that's just a camera trick, there it is. That's him actually walking between the towers. The building on the right is number two World Trade Center. It's where they later built the observation deck. And that is uh, Bleak Deep walking south, heading to number two World Trade Center. Austin J. Tobin Plaza, as the slide says, is a great place for a picnic. Here I was, this country boy from North Carolina, country coming down, moved to New York City in 1997. I was so flippin' excited about being there. And every chance I got, I would go down there and just sit there and look up, staring at these towers at all, for they were so beautiful. And Austin J. Tobin Plaza, was an excellent place for a picnic. Anytime you go down there during the middle of the day, you'd have people juggling, people selling flowers, musicians, you know, panhandling, getting some money. But they also had concerts down there. Like the New York Philharmonic would play down there. It was a beautiful, it was just a lively, lovely pet place. You could even go down there at midnight when there's not really anybody around, and you would still just be awestruck at the towers just you know just, just their majesty it was just a majestic place it was so peaceful and so calm and so beautiful and for those of you who never got to see the tower before they collapsed i wish you had please you get a copy of that movie it's really good that is the koenig sphere it was placed directly in the middle of Tobin plaza it's about uh, 20 feet tall and I remember after the towers had collapsed, you could still see what was left of that sphere in the rubble pile. And I know that the, our lighting is not that great right now. Maybe those of you in the front seat can, maybe folks in the back cannot. But you can see there's scars and deep, huge lacerations and gouges taken out of that beautiful piece of artwork. Just to give you an idea of the destruction that day. After the World Trade Center, before there was an actual World Trade Center memorial, the Koenig Spear was taken south in Battery Park. Battery Park. And it was along, along with what they call the Eternal Plane, which is similar to the plane that wrestled with President John F. Kennedy's grave. The plane and the Koenig Spear became the first World Trade Center monument. Beautiful buildings, as I said before. This is looking inside number one World Trade Center, which is the North Tower. This is inside the number two World Trade Center. As you can see, these buildings are 250 by 250 ginormous buildings. And if you ever go there at 8 o'clock in the morning, you can forget it. Remember, I said there's 55,000 people there. And it is hustle and bustle. It's a train wreck trying to get in that place in the morning. All the people trying to get to work. This is my buddy Hector. Hector Luis Gerardo, Puerto Rican American from the South Bronx. Hector was my best friend. We worked EMS together. We worked in the Bronx together. And I learned a lot from this young man. Hector's father was a Vietnam veteran. His family, growing up very poor, Latino in the South Bronx had a rough growing up. Hector's father was a Vietnam veteran, got hooked on the drugs in Vietnam. Sheriff Dean was big back in the 70s, you know? He was educated. Drugs, he played this, this opioid epidemic we got going on in the United States pretty bad now. You should have seen it back in the 70s. Hector's father came home from Vietnam addicted to heroin. Sheriff Dean was in the South Bronx. Acquired a disease called AIDS, which we did not even know existed at the time. Hector's father died when Hector was young. Hector's mother also died when Hector was young. And Hector didn't have to raise his siblings. Hector was my best friend. Hector was a good kid. There is a line in the movie, Backdraft, which was the first even though there was the towering Inferno and other firefighting movies that come out before Backdraft, but that was the first one I remember because that's when I 
1991, that's when I started my fire service career in the early 90s. There was a line in the movie, Kurt Russell says to his wife, talking about his fire service career, and he was talking about his marriage, but he was also referring back to the firehouse. He says to her, you don't leave people hanging. You don't leave people hanging. Hector and I were assigned to the exact same shift. We were buddies together, we worked EMS together in the Bronx, we were in Kobe school together, on Randall's Island, we were in the same squad, same platoon, we were study partners in the academy. He was my brother. We were assigned out of rookie school to different firehouses. He went to 23 engine, Midtown Manhattan. I was assigned to 280 engine, Brooklyn. We worked the exact same shift. And every time we'd work, we'd call each other up because I knew he was working. Hey, brother, how you doing? I'm good. Hey, Phil, how's it going? Hector's good, man. Have brownstone fire this afternoon and this morning. Have a tax fire. I'm in the borough of fire, man. I'm, I'm working. I'm having a blast. Just like I said, I was going to be in rookie school, man. I'm going to fire. How about you, Hector? Oh, we just had a couple EMS runs today, but we had a pretty interesting smoke alarm uh, on the 97th floor of the Empire State Building. You know, he was working in the high rise capital world. Or as some people used to refer to Brooklyn, not the borough of fire, you can say the borough was tall tales and small buildings. But um, that's who you when you ask. That's probably a good hat guy would say something like that. So every shift I called Hector, hey, how you doing? And we're going to hook up, right, Phil? We're going to hook up, right, brother? Yeah, yeah, we're going to hook up. You should have another family in the Bronx. Come over to the Bronx, man. We'll have some of our Have some Puerto Rican food. He said, yeah, I'll go back to the Bronx for these days. We need your family. We need some Puerto Rican food. We we'll have a beer together, right, brother? Yeah, man. Next year, Hector, you ready to call his name? Oh, man, we ain't turned the wheel all day, bro. What about you? Yeah, we only had one. Well, I'll talk to you later, Hector. We're going to hook up, right? We're going to hook up. Yeah, we're going to hook up, man. We're going to hook up, yeah. We'll get together, bro. We'll get together, bro. Hector Toronto was killed on the morning of 9 11, 2001. We never hooked up. We never got together after public school. I never got to say my goodbyes to one of my closest friends. Backdraft movie. Don't leave people hanging. It's been 20 years, and inside my heart, I still feel guilty. So I left the brother hanging. I stood him up. I left the brother hanging. And I never got to say my goodbyes. Never got to say my goodbyes to her. What time do you got? Oh, the clock might be in there. I'll tell you what it is. Take a break. Don't leave people hanging. Don't leave people hanging. For those of you who are married, you run a fire call in the middle of the night, kiss your husband and wife goodbye. Hey, honey, we're taking a smoke alarm. Love you. For those of you who are career firefighters and have to work a shift, call your spouse up and say, hey, I'm doing well. Just took a shower. It's 11 o'clock. I love you. I love you. Let people know how you feel about them. You're not guaranteed it's tomorrow. Not guaranteed it's tomorrow. Last year, July 19, 2020, I lost my wife for 14 years. Unexpectedly. I'm currently working as a paramedic in North Carolina. At the time, we were still working 24 hour shifts instead of 12 hour shifts. And I'd come home from a 24 hour shift and I'd stop at a restaurant and buy breakfast. Or we'd come in and have a cup of coffee whether we ate breakfast or not. And my wife loves cigars just as much as I do. And it was kind of funny because she decided when I came home from work that morning, she was going to have a cigar with me. She's like, Want to go in here in your office and sit and have a cigar? We'll talk. I said, Sure, then. Was the last cigar I had with my wife, July 19, 2020. Went upstairs, just got off a 24 hour shift, had breakfast and a cigar with my wife, went upstairs to take a nap. Came downstairs around 4 40 that afternoon, found her dead on the couch. Found her dead. She was only in her 50s. She had not been sick, no cancer, nothing like that. I did not get to say my goodbyes. 
Tell your family that you love them. Tell your family that you love them. Don't look that angry. Tell your brother firefighters you love them. Excuse my language, there are other children present. Well, freak you, you well, freak you, yeah, yeah, freak you, freak you, Because we're brothers, that's what family does, right? Family, we bicker all the time. For family. You have a bicker with another guy in the firehouse, another gal in the firehouse, hey, ah, 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 thank you. Don't go to that anger. Sometimes we're getting into your shift saying, hey, listen, I'm sorry. We're good, we're good, brother, we're good. So good, right, Gene? So good. Whether it be a brother, firefighter, the chief, your captain, or if you're the chief and captain, you're subordinates. Don't leave things unsettled. Because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. But here's a funny thing, speaking of 9-11. Earlier I said, what does 9-11 mean to you? 343 firefighters, New York City Fire Department employees, all of them knew going into the job, including the police officers who were killed that day, Every last one of them knew when they signed on the bottom line and stood there and took that oath, I swear to protect the citizens of the city of New York. Every last one of them knew that you may not make it 20 years to retire. Some of you will leave this job in a fine box. That's the chance we're willing to take. Partly because we're kids, we know any better, you know? We were in for the excitement, the adventure of fighting fire. That's what it takes to save another human life, life, to be a good citizen, to be a good partner, lay my life down, so be it, let it happen, let it happen. You know what I mean? It's part of the job. It's part of the job. We have no choice. We expect it. The problem is over 2,800 other people did not expect it, right there. Innocent women, innocent men. Ladies put on their skirts and heels. Guys put on their ties and grab the briefcase. People went to the World Trade Center to make an honest living that day. And did come home. Now, I was having a picnic with a guy about 10 years ago. My buddy. He says, hey man, my boss invited me over for a picnic. This was in North Carolina. My boss invited me over for a picnic. Come with me. I said, all right, I'll go with you. He's not honest guy. I'll go with you to the picnic. Politics came up. So this guy starts bigger, not knowing that I'm a New York City firefighter retired, not a survivor. World Trade Center, the Muslims did it. World Trade Center, the Christians caused it. The Democrats knew about it, they did nothing about it. The Republicans did it. But George Bush did it, but Barack Obama did it. Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, Democrats, liberals, conservatives, Republicans, left-wingers, right-wingers, Clinton, George Bush, George H.W. Bush, this, Christians, Muslims, conservatives, he went down and blamed every political, ethnic, and religious group, some way, somehow, not my love. I just sat there and gave him a motion. Finally, when it was time to leave, I stood up and said, Sir, with all due respect, this with all due respect, you just spent 30 minutes calling out everything and everybody, every religion, every religion, every race, every political party, pointing a finger at all of them. Did you ever take time out, instead of spend all that time and energy to find blame for somebody? Did you ever take time out of your busy life to remember the name of at least one person? There's over 3,000 of them to choose from. I said, sir, can you tell me the name of one person? You couldn't, can you spend the energy to tell me the name of one person who died on 9-11? Well, no, I can't. Have a nice day. Okay, let's take a break, folks. Well, welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your break. I'm sorry I was starting a 10-minute break. 
So I told you about my buddy, Hector Luis Irado. And I told you a little something personal about his father, and maybe I shouldn't have even installed there. I know it's, that's, um, that's family privilege and information that Hector shared with me about, about his father and everything. I probably shouldn't have. But it is what it is. Hector's not suffering anymore. Hector gave his life for the citizens of the city of New York. Hector's in heaven with his father now. Hector was my best friend. And Hector was a good dude. Hector, growing up, a poor Puerto Rican kid in the South Bronx, would come over to my house and hang out with me and study when we were in probate pro school. Probationary firefighter academy called probate school. And we get a snack. And he'd say, hey man, go up to the store. We want some ghetto chips? That Puerto Rican accent of his, I said, What the heck is ghetto chips? You know, ghetto chips. I said, No, I don't. I'm not even a southern boy. I know what Doritos are, you know, Fritos, barbecue, Lay's. What, what the hell is ghetto chips? You know, what they call party mix? It's got a, a corn chip in it. It's got a. You, this guy is shaking his head. He knows what I'm talking about. It's got. It's, yeah, he's enjoyed too many party chips lately. <laughs> so, party chips, party mix, you can get it at the supermarket. It's got like a Dorito style chip in it, a Frito corn chip. It's got a uh, pretzel. That seems like there's one more in there, isn't there? A Cheeto, that's it. Hector called them ghetto chips. I said, Hector, why do you call them ghetto chips? He says, well, you know those small bags of chips. He says, why would I want to go down to the bodega, which is a Spanish word for you know, corner store. He says, why would I go to the little corner store, bodega, and pay like a dollar for this bag, and a dollar for this bag, a dollar for this but I can just pay a dollar for one bag and get all four. I said, that makes pretty, pretty good sense. He goes, that's what it is when you go up to work the South Fox, bro. So ever since then, I've called party mix. Out of respect and memory of my brother Hector, ghetto chips. Now you know the story of ghetto chips. And that's one of the cool things about, um, I had the pleasure of a very break of meeting a Vietnam veteran. And one of the cool things about, you know, experiencing something like this or um, being in the military is you meet all different people from all different walks of life. And I'm sure that veteran will probably not, if you ask him anything about his war experience, will probably change his subject on you. Most veterans, including my brother-in-law who served in Vietnam, won't talk about the war and the bad stuff, but they'll tell you about something funny that happened to them. They can remember my grandfather was in World War II. He was a medic in World War II. He was on the beaches of Normandy. Actually, he was not on the beaches of Normandy on June 6, 1944. He sat out the English Channel with both rocking and him seasick. And as the boats walk rocking, he's watching a thousand of them. He's watching thousands of people die. On June 7, his craft landed. His responsibility was cleaning up the bodies. After fighting 1944, 1945, through the Battle of the Bulge and other famous battles, my father, my grandfather, who was a medic, had the unfortunate, unpleasant experience of evacuating the concentration camps and disposing of millions of Jewish bodies. He never talked about that. Never once did he talk about his horrors. But I saw that to say this, nine times out of 10, when I have a 9-11 memory, it's not about the horror that I saw that day, it's usually about something pleasant. The pleasantness of the place itself prior to the attack. Funny joke, funny saying, just something that someone I knew who died that day used to say or do. And that's the things I want to remember about 9 11, it's not the horrors. I want to remember the good people that we lost that day and the pleasantness that all, each and every one of them brought into this world, whether they were here as little. I think the youngest person who killed Tracer was like 18, and the oldest one was like 80. 
So 18 to 80, various walks of lives, average, plus that average is like maybe 35 years old or something like that. So the average World Trade Center, person who died in World Trade Center, 35 years of this person's life, male or female, black or white, doesn't matter. There's something cool and unique about that person that he or she experienced in his or her 35 years. That's how I want to remember World Trade Center, the cool stuff, not the horrors. Unfortunately, without those horrors, I wouldn't be here tonight. So let's get down to the dirty, get down to the nitty gritty. On the morning of 9 11, I had worked rather to say September 9, excuse me, September 10, I need a map. September 10, 2001, I had worked a night shift. In the New York City Fire Department, they work nine hour day shifts, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., and they work 15 hour night shifts, 6 p.m. to 9 a.m. I just come off a night shift. I had taken a detail, and what I detail is in the York City Fire Department is you've got another unit, another company that's short a man. Hey, this guy called out sick. We got one man too many here tonight. We're going to ship you over here to ride over here. Okay? They had shipped me to engine company 234 in Brooklyn, also one of the busiest engine companies in the bar world, or in the city for that matter. I worked at night shift at 234 engine. One of the traditions in New York City Fire Department has a lot of traditions. Out of respect, if you're riding as a guest in another company, they always give you early relief. Unwritten rule in New York City Fire Department is you show up an hour before your shift starts. So if you're working at 9 by 6, it's 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. shift. Ooh, excuse me. If you are working at 9 by 6, you show up at 8. Another thing you used to say in your city fire department is you knock on the door with your elbows and knees. It was an unwritten rule, also a tradition in your city fire department. And everyone brought something in a bag of bagels, a box of donuts, English muffins, water, carton of eggs. Guys would come in the firehouse because you can't. Hey, no one in the firehouse. Can't get in. My key won't fit. You can't get in the firehouse with your hands full, right? So you knock with your knees and elbows. That was an FPY tradition. So at breakfast time on the morning of September 11, I'm coming off a night shift to Engine Company 234. Another one of the traditions is, you know, the junior guy, say in your company, the junior guy, you come in, work the shift, you come in at 8 that morning, or 9 o'clock shift, you find out who the senior man is at work that last night. So you may be the senior man, and you say, hey man, what did you have last night? Oh, I had the nozzle. Okay, thank you. He takes his gear off the rig, you put your gear on the rig, that's at 8 o'clock in the morning, he's out the door by 8.15. You go home, he beats the New York City traffic, that's why we did that. He beats the New York City traffic, and he's going home to be with his wife and kids. Out of respect for the senior guy. On down the list, second most senior guy riding that ship, so on and so forth. Unless you had a guest in the house. Say, hey man, we got a detail last night? Yeah, read the board. Oh, Larimore, engine 280. All right, hey Larimore, you're up. Get out of here. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. So I got the opportunity to leave 234 engine because I got an early relief. Now my plan, I did a lot of overtime. We worked a lot of ship swaps with other members. My plan on the morning of the 11th was to go home and tune the world out. I was exhausted. I knew I was supposed to come back on the 12th. I can't remember if it was a day shift or a night shift. I believe it was a day shift. So my plan was to go home on the 11th. I literally was going to unplug the phone and everything. He didn't have cell phones. I mean, they were just coming out. He'll probably say, 2001, he still had phones that plugged into the wall. I was going to turn off the phone, tune the world out for roughly 24 hours. I was exhausted, but I didn't do that. Okay. Plus, I was coming in on the 12th to work a payback shift for a guy named Joe Monteverto. We called him Mouse. The mouse had a wild guy who was 300 pounds, Italian American, who would have a tattoo of Mickey Mouse on his leg. This is back, you know, 20 years ago, tattoos weren't as popular as they were as they are today. Why the hell this guy had a tattoo of Mickey Mouse on his leg? I don't know, but we call him the mouse. I was supposed to work the 12th of the a month birthday. So I got early relief, the 234 engine, and I'm heading home. At the time, I was living in Massive, New York. 
Massmouth is a subdivision or a neighborhood within the borough of Queens, mostly uh, Italian and Irish in, in uh, Massmouth. Now, a little something I didn't tell you before. When I was a medic in the EMS division, we cool keep Okay. When I was a medic in the EMS division, they had something called HAZTAC, Hazardous Materials and Tactical Operations, a tactical medic. We had forceful entry tools, rescue gear, SCBAs, level A, B, C, all kinds of hazmat stuff. We had antidote kits, you know, atropine, two man fluoride, um, you name it, any type of um, chemical weapon, chemical weapons of mass destruction type stuff. And we'd go out here and decon people and give them antidotes. That was our job. We were tactical medics. So I had gotten tactical medic trained. As a at the NY paramedic, and I was assigned to the bar of Bronx, unit 150. So I had to go right by the Massive Firehouse, Squad Company 288, Hazmat 1. So I'm heading through Massive on my way to my apartment. And at the last minute, I don't know why, I decide I'm going to, you know what, I haven't seen these guys in two years or so. I've been talking to these guys a long time since my initial Hazmat training. A tactical med training. I'm just going to stop in the hazmat one and say hello and see how these guys are doing. And that is FDY hazmat one, and that is squad 288, the rig anyway. A routine Tuesday morning. Routine Tuesday morning. Who would have thought an incident like 9 11? A routine Tuesday morning. The sun's coming up. It's a pretty cool day. A little bit of a breeze, it's a beautiful day. Nothing special about this day. So I decided to stop by Hazmat 1, Squad 288, and tell one of our friends. So I walked into the firehouse. 68 Street Firehouse in Massachusetts, New York. If you've ever been to New York, you know it's a very loud city, right? And we're all firefighters here, and pardon the, the term. We like to break walls, bus stops, talk smack, talk shit. You know, get under each other's skin. That's, you know, there's no saying in New York, if you're not picked on, you're not loved. If you're not loved, you're not picked on. All right? So if I'm breaking your balls, talking crap, not behind your back, that is. If I'm talking crap, breaking your balls, busting chops, that means I like you, okay? If I don't like you, I'm, I'm going to give you cold shoulder. That's just that's a New York tradition. That's a firehouse tradition. I'm telling you what, I don't care if you're in Toronto, Ohio, you're in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, St. Louis, Missouri. I don't know if something wrong for you. Guys are doing what we're doing right now, sitting around and enjoying each other's camaraderie and probably breaking balls. Right, John? New York City Fire Department, what are doing right now? They're breaking balls. Winston Salem Fire Department, North Carolina, what are they doing right now? Sitting around, enjoying their camaraderie, busting chops, right? That's what we do in the firehouse. So I rolled into the firehouse, it's shift change. Remember when everybody comes in an hour early, right? So I roll into the firehouse. Now this particular firehouse, they run eight on the hazmat, six on the squad. So that's, four, and that's at least 14 firefighters there, plus some who are coming off of duty. So we probably have about 20 guys, 20, 25 guys in the firehouse at that shift change. And every firehouse in the city of New York is always loud, always obnoxious. It's a shift change. Guys don't come in there and break walls. You know, the dogs back. That's the way it is. If you've ever been to New York City, you know it's a very loud place. Oh, and by the way, did you know that every New York City firefighter's first name lives, ends with A? You know that? We're not, no, we're not talking about the Canadians going, A. Hey, hey, did you watch the hockey game last night, A? We're not talking about that, A. We're talking about Joey! Hey, Bobby! Hey, Tony! Oh, Jimmy! Philly! <laughs> if your name was Brenda, it would be Brenda! So I'm coming to the firehouse, hey, Billy, how you doing? Guys are breaking balls, being loud. Just what they do. You know, this is one of the largest cities in America, almost 10 million people, and everybody in that city's got attitudes, it's a language. So what do you do to compensate for everyone else's attitude? You create an attitude of your own. Okay? You got red chops, this guy's breaking your balls, you break his balls right back. You know, it's the whole mind is bigger than yours concept. It's New York City. Besides that, if you're not loud, who the hell's going to hear you in New York City? Because everyone else is loud as hell. If you've ever been to New York City, you know it's a very loud city. 
all the concrete and steel high-rise buildings, that sound, the sound of the city has nowhere to go. If you ever go on top of the Empire State Building, on top of the World Trade Center, whatever high-rise building you go on top of in New York City, even though you're a quarter mile above it, you still hear this, oh, do you not hear it? Yeah, there's a hum in the city, there's a sound in the city. In fact, Neil Diamond wrote a song about it. It's a loud city, so you have to talk loud to be heard. So guys are going to break the ball. Hey, Philly! The guy on the right, firefighter Kevin Smith. Very senior firefighter. This is the kind of guy the world could be falling around falling apart around him, and he's not going to get excited. Why? Because he's been there and done that. He's got confidence. He trusts himself. He trusts in his skills. He trusts his brother firefighters. He knows they got his back. He knows he's been well trained. He knows he's crawling down hallways. Kevin Smith, stand out in front of the World Trade Center, excuse me, stand out in front of the massive 6 HP firehouse. <laughs> Playing against the towers. Hey, Rose, side along. World Trade Center just got hit by an airplane. The airplane just hit the New York Tower. What? What that? The guy doesn't even get excited. Just as calm as can be. Does not even get excited. It's going to work. Side along. Put down a cigarette. It's on the ring. Why doesn't he get excited? Because this is what he trained for. You know what I mean? Do you think uh, Tom Brady, Ben Roethlisberger? Oh my God! 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 No, this is what these guys live for. This is what they trained for. This is what Ken Smith trained for. This unit, the squad 288, has that one. Are some of the first line units that the FDY uses in response to terrorism and acts of uh, domestic violence, excuse me, uh, domestic terrorism, weapons of mass destruction. He never got excited. Flips his cigarette and says, Trade Center just got hit, guys, let's go. Eight forty six AM, Kevin comes in the firehouse, flips side cigarette. Now what you're seeing in this photograph is not a photograph that I got from a magazine, did not download it off the internet, did not come out of a newspaper or other, other forms of media. This is an actual photograph that I took. But remember, I just got off the night shift at 234 inches. I didn't want to go back to my car. I was dropping gear back off. I just threw it in front of my car went cold. Which was actually an FDY no-no, but I did anyway. American, I, uh, excuse me, American Airlines Flight 11 impacts number one, World Trade Center at 8.46 a.m. This is Borden Avenue in Massimus, Queens, New York. Just to give you an idea of how freaking huge this city is. That's probably five, five or more miles away. That's Manhattan, way over there. We're in the borough of Queens here. That picture is an actual photograph that I took. Grabbed by uh, 35 millimeter, most of you probably don't really know what that is, cell phone nation. 35 millimeter camera. Click, click, click. That was it. Only had like three shots on my camera. Threw my camera in my car. That was the last photograph I ever took from World Trade Center. I never actually took any photographs while I was working the pile. That's what we call the World Trade Center sign after the towers collapsed. The pile. Never took any of this. The last one I ever took. If you notice the photograph, part of the cloud is like very large, very round. Up there to the upper left. That was the initial explosion. That was the initial boom. What you see, and then the smoke starts to dissipate southeast. So that's the actual photograph. We've seen the photograph that the South Tower is not even yet in. Yet. We jump on the rig, going into Manhattan, go through the Queens Midtown Tunnel, come up on Third Avenue in Manhattan, right about 63rd Street, start heading southbound. A lot of people ask me, they said, Bill, what was going through your mind? What was it like? I was scared. It be I was scared. There, I was still probing. Probationary firefighter with roughly one year old job. I was scared. Plus, I'm also scared because I remember in the back of my brain because I was a hashtag. 
hazardous materials and tactical operations, that he indeed trained them. So I'm thinking, what is the potential that I'm about to see? So I'm a little scared. Probably of an idiot know what's going on. I jump on the bridge. So I'm riding in with has that one. What about everybody else? You were scared. You damn right I was scared. What about everybody else? These guys were suited up in the back of the rig, putting on their bulky gear, putting on their hood, getting their mask on. We call it an SCBA, the mask, you got know, KY. Put on their airbags, getting ready to go. These guys want to work. You know, like the military says, lock and load, right? <laughs> ready to go to work. Come on, ready to go to work. That's what we train for. These guys were ready, these guys were prepared. And if any of those guys were scared, we sure as hell didn't show it to me. These guys were just as calm as could be. Well, why is that? Again, as I said, because they trained for it. World Trade Center, Empire State Building, Brooklyn Bridge, uh, M, uh, Statue of Liberty, there's a lot of high, high probability targets for terrorism in New York City. And because remember February 26, 1993, they had done it before. So why would they do it again? So it was all from 1993 up until 2001. It wasn't a matter of if, it was a matter of when. So why were they so calm? Because they knew that it's up this day eventually happened. And they were calm. Not cocky, calm. Because they were prepared for it. They were well trained. They knew they were well trained. Confident, yes. They were the New York City firefighter. They were the Marine Corps of firefighting agencies. Recon. Tough guys. You got this. We're dead. Fine. Don't be arrogant. Don't be overconfident. But be confident, please. Don't doubt yourself. Next time you go to a fire, no, hey, I got this. I got this. Because I know they're well trained. I got this. Be well trained. Get trained. Be well trained. As Jeremy said earlier today, train your brother firefighter. Or thank you for you guys here today. Pass it on. Pass it on to other people. And when you know that the people around you are well trained, just as trained as you are, you've got no reason to be you've got no reason to not be confident. You know what I mean? These guys are confident. The general on the right, our partner Timothy Bolte, Squad Company 288, was right and has a unit that day. It's a walk-in style body. I think I showed it to you earlier. It's a walk-in style technical rescue, three action rig. There was a scuttle hatch on top. And what guys used to do is they used to stick their head out of the scuttle hatch and see. So when we're heading south on uh, Second Avenue in the bar of Manhattan, oh fudge! Oh god! What? What well, Timmy? What? We can't see through the front rig. Second plane just got hit. I mean, second tower just got hit by another plane. So if the first one wasn't evident to you that this was an act of terrorism, this one definitely sure was. I didn't see it happen. I'm in the rig. That guy actually saw it happen. Just like Kevin Smith saw the first one happen. So, how did you know it was a terrorism attack? Well, of course, we knew it was a terrorist uh, attack of terrorism because we trained for it, we prepared for it. We also knew it was a terrorism uh, attack of terrorism because here's, here's the big deal. How can you be a professional pilot? And uh, of course, we didn't know it was a uh, hijacking, we didn't know, but the point is, how can you be a professional airline pilot? Flying a plane is that dang big and having a thorough understanding of flight laws and rules. How do you not see a bill with a, a, a high rise building that's a quarter of a mile high in the sky? How do you not see that? that would be, you know what I mean? That's not an accident. You don't just accidentally fly to, you know, one of the largest buildings in the world. You, come on, that's ridiculous. The FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, has very, 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 very strict flight rules around the river city. Meaning how high you can fly, or how low you can fly, and how long you can fly over the city. They want to get these planes in and out to limit stuff like this. If you've ever flown into LaGuardia Airport, one of the busiest airports in America, one of the smallest at the same time, to limit that amount of time that the air, commercial aircraft is flying over the city of New York, they wait the last minute. We're not talking about slow descent coming into Cincinnati. They wait the last minute and they go dive bomb into New York City. And when they take off, leaving New York City, he's playing the same thing. You want to limit the amount of time you're over the city. You come out of the end of the runway, you don't take slow ascent. <laughs> These planes go like a fighter plane, just straight up. They're not German, that's New York City. And we all knew that. There's no way ahead this was an accident. It 
had to be an act of terrorism. So, riding past that one, we eventually make it to the west side, which is where World Trade Center is. We head south on the West Side Highway, also known as South Street. We parked our rig on the corner of West Uvizi, which is on the northwest corner of the World Trade Center site. My buddies, I told you about earlier, when I was a teenager, used to come up and ride what we call Buff. He used to Buff New York. An engine company 40, ladder right? company 35. 40 engine and 35 truck parked their rig right beside Hazmat 1. This man here, Jimmy Guyverson. Jimmy Guyverson, when I was a teenager, teenager and a volunteer firefighter still in North Carolina, this man is somebody I looked up to very, very, very much. And Jeremy, he had a Fox 1971 mustache. So he would have been at home with us, that mustache. That was good for us, though. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, Lance. <laughs> Jimmy was a show for a 35 truck that day. Jimmy got off the rig about the same time I got off as that one. Looked over at me. Hey, Phil. It's good to see you. And Jimmy was a big man. Jimmy was like uh, Shrek back here. Aaron Blake. Jimmy was probably 6'4. Big dude. Big hands, I mean big hands. And here's a scary, spooky thing. Right now, as we speak, I can actually still feel Jimmy's hand. And he shook mine. He said, Phil, it's good to see you. Shook my hand. He said, I'll talk to you later. Those are the last words spoken to me by James Guyerson. James Guyerson and all of the firefighters from Engine 40, Ladder Company 35, were killed that day. These are guys I looked up, looked up to. These are guys I used to ride with when I was a teenager. These are the guys I wanted to be like. These were my heroes. These were my friends. And we lost them all that day. When we arrived at World Trade Center, this is what we saw. Now we're parked right underneath two towers, both of which are a quarter of a mile high, 1,350 plus feet. And we're looking straight up and we're seeing this. And these buildings are just huge. I mean, these amazing buildings anyway. Even more amazing if you're seeing that. Now earlier today I showed you a film of the World Trade Center and I showed you some pictures of what the buildings looked like when they were being erected. And you got to see those window columns. And you got to see how narrow the window columns are. And when someone is almost a quarter of a mile in the sky above you, it's very hard to make out what you're seeing. We had a telescope with binoculars on the hazmat truck. And we looked up and oh my god. Not maybe not a great picture, but if you go to your front row, you might be able to see some of these guys back here. In that picture, you're seeing three, four, or five bodies stacked high. Innocent women, innocent men, civilians. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to get to that window to get a breath of fresh air because they're actively dying from asphyxiation. People are standing on top of each other, literally, like a big sandwich pile, like sardines in a can. These people are trying to get a breath of fresh air. These are the horrors that we saw that day. And if you see the wreckage of the World Trade Center, you know, where the planes actually went in, plus, remember, it's not just where the planes went in, it's where the planes went in and all the floors above that site. So it could be as high as 30 floors of that. 30 floors is almost 500 feet, right? 400 feet, something like that. But nothing but that. On, all, on each floor, and when we're part, we're only seeing two sides of the building. We're not seeing all four. To think that this is what's going on with all four sides of each tower. Three, four, and five bodies stacked high on each floor. People trying to get breath of fresh air. In this picture to your left, there's a human being hanging on an IV in the hole where one of their went in. I think, Jeremy, that might be the South Tower, I'm not really sure. Just think, this guy is almost a thousand feet in the sky in a building that sways six feet either way. Six feet either way, he's hanging on with your life. He's not technical rescue trained. He's not got ropes and harnesses. Things, carabiners, and things that's going to latch into that building. He's holding home for your life. That building is swaying. To the right, a picture of a person falling out of the sky. 
one of the most offensive things you can say to a survivor of the World Trade Center incident or a family member of a person who died in the World Trade Center, one of the most offensive things you can say to them is refer to the World Trade Center site as Ground Zero. Ground Zero, that's what we call Hiroshima. These people are our enemies. These people are not enemies. These are American civilians. Innocent people. That's not Ground Zero. These are not for some scumbags. Oh, cockroaches, there he goes. Ground Zero, got off. It's not Ground Zero. That's World Trade Center. We still refer to it as World Trade Center. Another thing that you can say that's offensive to someone who survived World Trade Center or someone who lost a loved one at the World Trade Center is to refer to anyone who fell out of those buildings and died as a jumper. Oh yeah, I turned on the CNN news and I saw the jumpers. How do you know this person jumped? Do you know what was going on inside this guy's head? You don't know what caused him to fall out of the sky. Chances are he might have a jump. He's up there suffocating to death. He's breathing black putrid smoke, toxic gases, superheated gases, his skin may be burned. And he may have elected to say, you know what, I'm just going to end it all. I'm suffering. It's easier just to toss myself out this window onto a concrete surface a thousand feet below me than to endure this suffering any longer. So is there a possibility that some of these people get jumped? It's a possibility, yes. Now, there's also a possibility that with that building swaying, there's no glass in this building now. Maybe this person got tossed out of the building by the building itself. Think about that. We're all firefighters here. We know what superheated gases do. Heat rises, right? Thermal currents. So perhaps this per person was tossed out of the building because the building is swaying. Perhaps this person was sucked out of the building by the super high winds, a thousand feet in the sky. Perhaps this person was pushed out of the wind, out of the building, by the thermal currents, the updraft of the fires beneath them. Perhaps this person was mistakenly pushed out by other people trying to get a breath of fresh air. By referring to someone who fell out of the World Trade Center as a jumper, self judgment. You know? Oh, so this guy's, he committed suicide. <laughs> You know, well, let's look at this guy, he committed suicide. Not one death certificate, not one death certificate over, over the 3,000 people who died at the World Trade Center says jumper. New York City OS, um, Office of Chief Medical Examiner, OCME. They have to put a cause of death, right? Heart attack, gunshot, wounded, struck by a car. Not one person has the word jumper or suicide on their death certificate related to 9 11. You know what the, each and every one of those 3,000 death certificates says? Homicide. Because think about it this way if this person's burning or if this person is suffocating, there had to be a reason why. And that reason was caused by another person who flew an airplane into that building. Does that make sense? Cause and effect. This airplane and the subsequent fire caused this person to jump. That didn't get the person to jump. Homicide. And these rat bastards who flew these planes into the, into the uh, oh no, he didn't kill 3,000 people. He only killed 2,126 for the rest of them actually jumped. Let's not take any heat off these people. You know what I mean? Let's give them what they were, what would he do? Let's make it clear that. 3,000 people were killed because of their actions. Homicide. So this is what we saw on the exterior of the building. Here's what they were seeing on the interior of the building. Mass chaos. Thousands of people coming down those stairs while firefighters and rescue workers trying to get up those stairs. Take a look at the civilians on the left there. Notice that these gentlemen, their shirts are slightly down and gray and black. What does it tell you? These people were up there. That guy right there. Now, for those of you who are EMTs and do medical work, you see that guy come out of the building, that's where your priority patients, right? Smoke inhalation, exhaustion, exertion, burns. We'll be sure 
He's smoke stained and he's wet. That tells me he was in the vicinity of the fire. The picture on the right, Calisto Anaya, engine company four, probationary firefighter. Aside from his probationary school ID card badge that was made, this is the only known picture taken of Calisto Anaya during his entire career. This was Calisto Anaya's very first fire and his very last fire. You're not guaranteed it tomorrow. Greenwich, Liberty, Beasy, and West Streets are the names of the streets that surrounded the World Trade Center complex. Outside, people were falling to their deaths. We have some children in the room. I don't know who their parents are, but the next slide may be very disturbing to children. I'll let you use the discretion if you wish to. Your child, not my child, so what you wish your child to see, it's up to you, not me. The next picture is maybe disturbing. The human body falling, terminal velocity, slamming into a concrete surface. And as I stood outside those buildings, I watched hundreds of people fall to their deaths. The next slides are not deceased persons from the World Trade Center, but the next slides are representative of the things that we saw. That's what a human body looks like when it explodes on a sidewalk. The pictures to the left is actual World Trade Center. That's the COVID plaza we talked about. Remember I said they had concerts? There was a stage, a tent set up for a concert, and each red square, this is taken during the incident, each red square is a human body. And you're standing there watching this 26-year-old kid. There goes another one. There goes another one. There goes two. Husband and wife are holding hands. And they drop. It takes about three seconds to four seconds for a human body to fall, fall for a mile. Roughly four seconds. And you can see a person fall. And you can count it down and you can say, one one thousand, two one thousand. Three one thousand. That is the actual sound that it makes. There are documentaries of World Trade Center, uh, of, of firefighters on World Trade Center. You'll see firefighters standing in the lobby at the lobby command post during the World Trade Center. I believe there were some uh, French guys who made, made a documentary about the incident because they were there. And you'll see firefighters in the documentary at the command post waiting to have an assignment to go up. Hey, engine six, go to the ninth floor, fire fire, go. Ladder seven, go to the 95th floor, go. Wait for an assignment from the, from the chief officers. And in the background, you hear a boom. Every so often, you hear a boom. Sounds like a shotgun. It really goes a boom. Boom. And you'll, uh, first few times you see it on that, on that French guy's film, you'll see a firefighter go. It's natural instinct. You hear something, you look. A boom. And you'll see a firefighter look. After about the third look, you don't see the firefighter turn around again. You don't. Know? Because what you're hearing is the sound of a human body exploding like one bullet. Bam! An arm goes flying over here. A head goes flying over there. Someone's guts go splatter on the windshield of the fire truck. These are civilians. And that's what's going on. And those of you who are in EMS have been a paramedic for 25 years. You get dispatched cardiac arrest calls. You go there, first it's in cardiac arrest, you start doing CPR, you work the code for 20, 25 minutes, however long it takes, unless you get pulses back. You push your drug, you have the for you get the you shock it, you give a lot of pain, you do everything you gotta do. But my question is, is that person dead? I don't know, you know what I mean? Sometimes you say, oh, this guy's dead. And after 20 minutes of pounding on this guy's chest, you get pulse back and go, hey, he lives. So therefore, was he actually dead? You know what I mean? You know what I mean, Eric? Or sometimes you, you, you work the entire protocol, 45 minutes, the guy's been flatlined for 45 minutes, and you just say, you know what, call it. Time of death, 9.55 p.m. 
right? And you, as a state certified paramedic, have the authorization to declare that person dead, or you load them up in the back of an ambulance, you take them to the ER, the ER doctor works on them for a minute, and the ER doctor, she says, all right, we're done here. I'm done dead. Then 15 p.m. Good job, everybody. And she walks away. So do you really know as an EMT when the person died? Or are they dead? You know what I mean? But I tell you what you do know. When you see a human body fall a thousand feet out of the sky, that split second that you heard that bang, you knew that's another person. I just witnessed another human being draw his or her last breath. I just witnessed the absolute cessation of human life. That was it. I just saw it. I just saw it. That just happened. I actually saw the beginning. I saw them alive. And I actually, the split second that they left this world to meet the maker, I saw it. And those are the things that haunt me sometimes. I very, 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 very rarely have nightmares or bad thoughts or bad memories about the World Trade Center, trying to travel around and play with things. But that sound and seeing a human being explode on the sidewalk is one of the thoughts that will always halt my mind. The World Trade Center, as I told you, I was off duty. I'm going to come over here and talk for a while. I'm going to get the closures in front of you, sir. I was off duty. There were several decisions that were made that day by great men that kept me alive. You know who great fire officers are? Great fire officers are made out of great firemen. Great chiefs are made out of great fire officers. Great decision making keeps your men alive. Sometimes great decision making, you still lose firefighters. It's inevitable sometimes. It's part of the job. But I can think of at least three occasions on 9-11 in which great decision making saved my life. When I pulled over the World Trade Center, I was off duty. What's supposed to be there? I jumped on the rig, which is a no, you know, no accountability thing. Like, oh, what's supposed to be there? So I jumped on the rig, we arrived in Manhattan, and the lieutenant on the hazmat one that day, Lieutenant John Critchie, turns to me and says, Phil, you're probing and you're off duty. I don't want to be responsible for you. I can't let you go inside. Wrong duty. I said, yes, sir, boo. And my adrenaline just went, oh, man. This is the big one. I was alive February 26, 1993. And I read all the stories, WNYF Magazine, Firehouse Magazine, Fire Engineering Magazine, documentaries about the big one. I want to be a part of the big one. Going there, four stores, crawling down the hallways, conduct searches. I want to be a part of the industry, man. And Lieutenant John Christian says, now, stay outside. Took the wind out of myself, brother. I want to be part of the big one. That decision saved my life. Unfortunately, it forced me to have to stand there on that sidewalk that much longer and watch more people, more, 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 more people explode on the concrete surfaces before my eyes. Finally, doo -doo -doo -doo, New York City radio. All off-duty New York City firefighters report to the World Trade Center or to your fire station. I know, I'm not excited now. I've been activated. I'm on duty, I'm on the clock now. I can go in and be a part of the action. Here we go. Firefighters from Squad 18 and one firefighter, like Mako, from Ladder Company 8. So, John Cirillo, Mike Mako, and how we stopped. Came to Hazmat One. We're gathering up tools. We're going in. We're going to make a team. Let's team up. Our plan was to go to the South Tower, Number Two World Trade Center, to operate there because Number Two World Trade Center was hit second. Therefore, we were under the impression that it probably had the fewest number of resources operating in that building and we could be most effective down there, which is south of the North Tower. We were parked north of the North Tower. So he said, we just go past the North Tower, let's head to the South Tower, and uh, check in with command post down there. That was our original plan. Myself, Howie Scott, 
John Cirillo, and Mike Mako. Who here knows who John Cirillo is? Okay. The, who was it, uh, Jeremy? NISD? NIST, NISD, did a whole bunch of, about 10 years ago, uh, studies on wind driven fires. You know, wind driven fires and high rise buildings. This guy here was one of the big guys who did uh, that research. So, we're heading south on West Street. We get, we're heading south. This thing here represents the number one World Trade Center, the North Tower. This finger is the number two World Trade Center, South Tower. We walk south and we get somewhere about here and we run into Chief Gansen, Pete Gansen, the chief of the department himself, the big man. That's like running into, let's say, if you're the Marine Corps, the Commandant of the Marine Corps. You may go your entire 20 plus years in the Marines and never see the Commandant. It's very rare that you ever see a guy that big in FDNY. Well, I just seen him a couple weeks ago, prior to this, in the medical office. I ran into him, and I said, spoken to him, said something to him about transfer out of 280 engine. Because at the time, probationary firefighters did something called a rotation. They would go to, FDNY has three houses. A houses are the very busiest companies. B houses and four C's are your slowest. They did rotation. You go to your initial house, you'll spend a year there. Go to your second house, spend a year there. And you know, you come, you basically you do three different houses before you come back to your initial house. At which point you are evaluated by your chiefs and your, your captain. I was an eight, eight engine. I wanted on my second rotation to go Pete truck, ladder 16. I saw Pete Gansey, the chief of the department, at the World Trade Center, he's in the middle of the command of a fire, looks at me and goes, Phil, yeah, ladder 16, I got you. Right? So he promised me he's going to let me transfer over to the 16 truck next year. But he remembered me. This guy's a great guy. You know, he's got 13 plus thousand people under his command, but can't you remember the little guy like me? This is a picture of Chief Dancy, William P. Hinn, first deputy fire commissioner. And I saw them both right before both of them died. Chief Gansey looked at me, looked at the uh, guys from Flight 18. This guy in particular, these guys have a great reputation for being hellacious firefighters, guys from Flight 18. He looked at me and says, Phil, squad, I got reports of a guy. He, he said it just like this. He goes, he goes I got reports of a guy uh, missing or trapped down there. A fire. He interrupts himself and goes, I got reports of a fire trap down there. Because what had happened right before we ran into the chief, the South Tower collapsed on top of us. So we dig ourselves out of the rubble pile of the South Tower. You know, this is a big building. We're not directly underneath the South Tower, but keep in mind this is a 1300 foot building, and that rubble, that debris went everywhere. So we dig ourselves out of the rubble pile of the South Tower when we run into this guy. And he says, I got a report of a fireman. The chauffeur 65 engine, go find him and get back in touch with me. Of course, he's the chief of the department. You're not going to say, man, I'm going to do what I want. You say, yes, sir. So Chief Yancey sends me and these other three guys I'm with south toward the rubble pile of the South Tower. And that was the second decision. The first thing good decision to save my life that day. That was the second decision that saved my life. Give me a break, everybody. Give me a break, we're almost done. So, I said great fire officers made out of great firefighters. Great fire officers made great chief officers. He Gansey was one of the best. He Gansey was one of the best fire officers in the history of the FDNY. A true fireman's fireman, a true fireman's chief, a true chief's chief. Man for the people. 
when the first World Trade Center collapsed, the South Tower did collapse, we were said, as I told you before, there was three great decisions, if not four, made by great men, that these decisions saved my life. That's why I'm here today. One, as I told you before, from John Christian, the Luke Denton has that one, get me out of the door. Number two, after the first tower collapsed, collapsed right in front of us as we're walking heading toward that tower. We'd have been in that building and did Decision number two was somebody gave a mayday, a firefighter gave a mayday, the chauffeur, so we call him driver or engineer in New York City Fire Department, the chauffeur 65 engine was buried under a pile of motorcycles. So what happened in the World Trade Center is when the planes went through the towers, the fire came out from the other side of the building. There was a lot of burning debris that fell to the ground. A lot of burning debris. The chauffeur 65 engine was putting out car fires with the booster line. It was, you know, people, uh, you know, high rise office building, people drive their cars to work, and they had bicycles and motorcycles lined up adjacent to one of those pedestrian crossway bridges on the West Side Highway, right outside Number 2 World Trade Center. When the Number 2 World Trade Center collapsed unexpectedly on top of him, he was buried under the debris of the World Trade Center, as well as under a pile of motorcycles. He gave a mayday, Armando Reno was the name of the chauffeur. So after the collapse of Number 2 World Trade Center, we're all sitting here going, what the fuck just happened? It was very, very loud. You see it on TV. You saw how dusty it was. It was so dusty. Of course, in our brains, we're not thinking. This is, this is not a, a wood rope brain out of the bush section of Brooklyn or a private dwelling in Queens. This is a Type 1 construction building. Concrete steel. And prior to the World Trade Center incident, there had not ever been one known high-rise building collapse due to fire. We had, you know, explosions, accidents, construction accidents, etc. This is the first one in America. So it's not coming to our brain that the World Trade Center just collapsed. I can't speak for the other firefighters in my group. What I thought when the World Trade Center number two's tower came down, I was thinking maybe a giant chunk of the building just fell off, like a parapet or something up top. I don't know. Cornice, it didn't register in my brain that actually when it collapsed. And of course, with all the um, the dust and everything, you can only see like the first and bottom 20 floors or so. You couldn't see the entire towers anyway. So we did not know that the towers were gone. We just thought something big from double floors they fall. So Pete Gansey, the chief of the department, sends me and the three guys I'm with. South and West Street to go search for the chauffeur of 65 engine. However, we're down to two guys now, myself and, and uh, John Cirillo, because when the towers did come down, the other two guys I was with, they just, oh, they took off. Gone. Where'd they go? I don't know. I'm not saying they're shirking their duties, I'm saying it was panic, everybody's running, oh, holy crap, what's going on? You know what I mean? Now, all the dust, you can't see 10 feet from your face anyway. So after the number two World Trade Center building collapsed, I ended up looking for the chauffeur of 65 engine by orders of the chief of the department. That was another decision that kept me alive that day. There he is, firefighter Armando Reno, engine company 65. So as we're walking south on West Street, also known as the West Side Highway, there's bodies laying everywhere. Bodies laying everywhere. Some alive. Some are dead. There's blood splatter everywhere. There's pieces of human bodies everywhere. And we're stepping over people. Because the chief of the department, the chief himself, had given us an assignment. And we were going to follow through with our assignment. There was a pregnant lady on the sidewalk. I come from a world of EMS where you help everybody. She's laying on the sidewalk, she's bleeding, she's crying, and I stopped and rendered care. John Cirillo says something along the lines of, fuck her. 
John, you can't just leave the property. Let's go. It wasn't until a few years later that I understood what he meant by that. And the EMT and me did not want to do this, but I literally had to step over this woman. Keep walking. He did not mean to be disrespectful or non compassionate. The issue was this. Number one, we're going to go rescue a brother fire. And when it's one of your own, your own take property. That's one of your own other trap. Number two, if she's out of the rubble pile and laying way up here on the sidewalk, she's relatively unfamiliar, isn't she not? She's not thin buried in that rubble pile, is she? That's what Trump was trying to say. We have a mission to believe. We're special forces today. Why are we special? Because we got a mission given directly to us from the chief himself. We got to carry this mission. We take priority over her. And there's hundreds, if not thousands, of people under that pile down there. In addition to the chauffeur 65 engine. The greater good, the whole concept, let's go help those people. We're going to stop and help one, or we're going to go down there and help hundreds. Many of whom are our brothers. We're trapped. She's out on the sidewalk. She may be hurt and bleeding. She's out on the sidewalk, bro. They're not. That's that whole field triage thing, right? Triage is a French word that means to sort. We had to go find Armando Reno, and we had to go find other people who were trapped inside the World Trade Center over the So we get all the way down there. Of course, we're not slackers. And all we heard was there's a guy down there. We did not have any particulars other than he was a chauffeur of 65 engine. We had reported to the World Trade Center site off duty, so we didn't have, we were not radio equipped. So it's not like being called without the radio. Everything is covered in dust. You can't see 15 feet in front of your nose. And because of all the dust, things were camouflaged. Cars didn't look like cars. Besides that, also things were crushed. A car or an ambulance is 10 feet tall is now two feet tall. And as we're heading south on West Street, every chance we get to look under something or look in something, for example, there was a whole bunch of ambulances out there and then they came by the paramedics. We looked inside almost every police car, ambulance, and fire truck that we could find, thinking maybe there might be some people inside those, those vehicles. We get all the way down there to the South Tower, what's left over the rubble pile of the South Tower. And we couldn't find Reno. We couldn't find this guy. Couldn't find the guy. So I tell John, I said, well, John, Let's head north back up to the, the one World Trade Center site. Report back to Chief Gansky, let him know that we couldn't find this firefighter. It's probably a false call. You know, this is radio communication. There probably never was a guy there to begin with. John once again says, fuck them. There's people down here. There are people in this pile, including our brothers. Go get them. All right, let's do that. We never, if you don't disobey a direct order, you know what I mean? Those cheap going to school lines got to get back with it. If you know the size of the World Trade Center, something, I mean, huge complex, it's over 18 acres. We're here, he's 200 plus yards that way, you know what I mean? And by the time you crawl over all the burning debris, it's crushed and covered with dust, it's taking age to get back to the cheap can't see. John says, fuck him. We got a mission to do right here. Let's do what we got to do. That's help people who are in this pile. And by, by this time, the, the, the smoke and dust is starting to, to rise a little bit, and we come to the knowledge of where's the, the tower is gone. And remember, I told you earlier, when I moved to the city of New York, I used to enjoy going down there, have a picnic, and enjoy that site. So I knew those buildings very well. I knew what they looked like, I knew what the skyline was like. And when you look at the World Trade Center, number two, South Tower, and you look and you see sunlight on the other side, you go, wait a minute, something's not right here. You know what I mean? <laughs> There's supposed to be a tower there. Only then did reality set in that the tower, the least the South Tower, was gone. 
Later in the afternoon, I'm jumping way in at my story. Later in the afternoon, uh, we did find Armando Reno, or I found Armando Reno. The man who actually, there really, there really actually was a trapped engine company chauffeur in that rubble pile. He was pinned under a pile of motorcycles, in severe pain, broken arm, broken ankle, broken ribs, and his front teeth. <laughs> <clears throat> front teeth knocked out, and his mouth is just full of what looks like sand, concrete dust. He can't hardly talk. There's a lot of blood coming out of his nose, blood coming out of his mouth. He's hurting, and I find the guy, and all you can see is his shoulder, his head, and one arm sticking out of the pile. I find the guy, I hold his hand, and start talking to him. I say, hey, buddy, it's going to be all right. My name is Philip Larimore. I'm a pro the engine company 280 in Brooklyn. Okay, get me out of here. So I'm holding the guy's hand. I said, what's your name, buddy? Remember the wheel. Excuse me? What's your name, buddy? Remember the wheel. I said, all right, Guido, we're going to get you out. <laughs> and uh, you've been around Italians, and Guido is a derogatory term for Italian-Americans. Not knowing the guy's an Italian. I actually literally thought he was telling me that his name was Guido. I literally did so the whole time I'm squeezing this guy's hand, I'm like, all right, Guido, we're good, man. We'll get you out of here, Guido. <laughs> so I wrote, he was trying to tell me, hey, asshole, that is not Guido. Or he might have taken it, like we talked about earlier, ball breaking. He might have taken that as a friendly gesture. You know, I said earlier, you're not lucky, not picked on him. I don't know what was on the Guido's head, but he might have taken it as a friendly gesture. But he called him Guido, like I was trying to pick at it and like his emotional and, and psychiatric load that he was under at the time. But for the longest time, in fact, I mean, I literally mean years, I thought the man's name was Guido. It turned out to be Reno. With a name like Armando, I'm not sure if he's Italian, he could be Latino. But uh, I was calling him Guido the entire time. That is a picture of us removing Reno later that afternoon after we found him alive in the rubble pile. Armando Reno is the only person I found alive in the pile. In fact, that is the largest piece of human body I found. Because at the World Trade Center site, we were not finding whole bodies. We were finding pieces. An arm here, a leg there. on my foot. So one of the things that uh, I found in the World Trade Center, we were crawling through one of the boys one day. This was uh, a couple weeks after the incident. We were way down like 20 feet deep. When you go down inside these boys inside the rubble pile, you turn on your flashlight, it's pitch black dark in there. Like being down inside a cavern. And you're 20 feet below a pile of steel. And the problem with that is, you don't know if you're going to make it out. If anything on that pile shifts, you're gone. But you're down in there with a flashlight. And we found what was left of the human body. It was, I don't know if it was male, female, black, white, Hispanic. I don't know what this was. I do know it was a human body. It was the left leg from here up half the pelvis, half the rib cage, collarbone, and half the arm. And some guts, pink stuff attached to it. And of course, all that was covered with the gray powdery dust that you see. I don't know what that was, but I know it was a human being. The leg was trapped in under steel beams. It'd be down for a couple of weeks and it stunk. Half of the human body, practically. Male, female, black, white, I don't know. It's half of the human body. No head. Leg was trapped under a steel beam. The military has something they call an E tool or a trenching tool. It's a collapsible shovel that they dig foxholes with, fill sandbags with. They took an E tool. And I chopped, and I sliced, and I chiseled. God was able to amputate that leg. 
took half of it in the body, put it in the body bag, put that body bag on my back, crawled out of that hole, crawled up to the top of the pile. We're talking 17 acres of destruction. Anywhere from as low as three feet to as high as 100 feet was the pile. 17 acres. He had to crawl. He had to crawl across that rubber pile to get to a board that they had set up on Liberty Street. It probably took us several hours to crawl across that rubber pile with a stinking corpse on my back. That's another thing that, uh, that I'll never forget until I die. The smells and the horrors down there. So while we were on top of the, the rubble pile of the South Tower, all of a sudden, but I can't explain why, God only knows why, things got real quiet all of a sudden. Real quiet. And we look around. So all this destruction from the World Trade Center South Tower. And one's a fire in the air, one about 100 yards over there. You know, we were in the black and yellow coat. There's one probably 80 yards over there. There's, there's just few of the people. I see few of the people around me. Where did everybody go? Where they all went? They were killed? In that South Tower collapse on top of them. But we're, there's those of us who are left on top of the world of the South Tower. And I hear, hey! North Tower's about to collapse. Get off the pile. Hey, get off the pile. You, I'm talking to you. Get off the pile. Oh shit, you're talking about me. <laughs> and you see pictures of the South Tower, you see what's left of the, of the, of the wall. The skin is sticking up, but I'm not too far from the skin. That's what's left of the building. You see the skin figure where the skin is kind of laid over like that. And I'm standing on top of the pile near the skin of what's left of the bottom floor of the World Trade Center Tower Road, too. Yeah, you. And that's when I realized that voice calling is calling for me. And I'm on top of the World Trade Center Rubble Tower, Rubble Pile, Tower Road, too, and I'm by myself. I'm the only guy on top of the pile. I look around and go, Shit. They all left me. But remember, I was the only guy named John Cirillo, who was what I think. I can't believe my buddy, right? The guy keeps screaming, let's go, get off the pile. He was an EMS battalion chief. Again. Decisions. 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 That's another decision made by a good officer that saved my life. That EMS battalion chief said, get off the pile, let's go. And when he called me off the pile, just seconds after we got off the pile, was when North Tower came down. And I wasn't getting off the pile without money. And I screamed and I yelled, Squad 18! John! Squad 18! And I'm yelling and I'm yelling and I'm getting no, nothing in return. And that's when you realize, I gotta go. And if he's out here, He's going by himself wherever he is. I'm going by myself wherever I is. Wherever I am, excuse me. <laughs> and I'm going to die. And the way things are looking, if this tower comes down, I'm going to die alone. Because i got no brother firefighters within 50 yards of me. And if I leave the pile, and the tower does come down with Papa John, then he dies alone. I left it, I banned my brother. All these kinds of crazy things are going through my brain. And now, somehow, I've got to climb across the pile to get to a place of refuge. One of the World Financial Center um, buildings across the street from the World Trade Center. A little bit above building construction. I love building construction. One of all the windows on the ground floor of the World Financial Center are completely blown out. There's no glass in from the South Tower collapse. Get across the street. Oh, it's like something out of a movie. Everything seemed to be slow mo. 
Tom Hanks movie Saving Private Ryan has moments in the opening battle scene which things were slow mo. That open battle, opening battle sequence in that movie also has things in which the sound is distorted. And I'm going to tell you, brothers, it does that. Your brain starts enhancing some of senses and starts shutting down others. Your brain starts messing with your body. Your sense of time, your sense of distance, all these things become screwed up. And then you get back. And I'm trying to get across the rubble pile. And I'm thinking, hey, wait a minute, I've got an SDPA on my back. Maybe if I drop this pack, I can move faster. I drop the pack. Dive, literally dive. And I still see my hands like Superman today. I still see my hands as I dive through the window, or what used to be a window, the World Trade Center site. Excuse me, World Financial Center across the street from the World Trade Center. Dive through the window, hit the floor. Training sets in again. Okay, what happens if this building collapses? What happens if number one tower collapses over this building? And it collapses? All this is going to be brain. Building structure. Where is some of the strongest areas of the building? On the corners, stairwells, elevator shaft. Follow me? I'm thinking elevator shaft. Let's go. I was able to crawl with another firefighter to an elevator shaft. I only knew this guy was, but he came in that window right behind me on top of me. He both dove to that window. Elevator shaft. Crawled in the elevator shaft. World Financial Center. This building right here. What we're talking about. K-28 AM. I don't have an SCBA. Crawled in the elevator shaft. Crawled to a corner. Bunker down. Ready to die. This North Tower comes down on top of us. And as you can see from the right, the picture on the right, everything pitch black near the cavern. The blackest black I've ever seen in my entire life. The lights go out instantly. Not the lights went out, there is no light because of the, uh, not that they shut the power off and go with what I'm flying. Everything goes dark, all that does. You can't see two inches in front of your face. And when the second tower came down, the North Tower, Trust me, brothers, it was worse than the first. When the second towers came down, you could hear it. It started out with a crack, like a tree limb, a tree falling in the forest. You hear the initial crack. Then all of a sudden, pancake collapsed. Boom, 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 and all 110 floors collapsed in a matter of about two and a half seconds. It happened that fast. And you could hear it all the way down. And you knew what was happening. You knew what was happening right over there. Right outside that building that you're in. Because there's no glass in the building. All that dust and debris covering the building. And as you're lying there, you're hearing the, the collapses around you, the only thing you can think of is I'm going, to, I'm going to die, but I don't know what's going to happen. Because what's going to happen is something's going to crush my skull like a brick while I'm lying here. And I won't know what's going to happen. And you lie on the floor in a corner next to an elevator shaft. And I put my mouth against the wall. I take my helmet off. I put my head in the helmet. I pull my hood up. I'm just trying to breathe. It's like going to the nicest, sandiest beach, dry, sandy beach in the summertime. It was like putting your mouth. Now check this out. You can breathe smoke. You go into a burning, uh, you know, training fire. They just teach how to make your mask off, breathe, breathe a little smoke. You can breathe smoke. Yes, there's particulate matter in there. But for the most part, smoke is gas, is it not? And we know how the lungs work. Gas. You can breathe gas even if it's helium. That's what the you know the commercial divers use. It's still a gas, right? You can't breathe solid. You cannot breathe a solid. And it was like going to the beach, the softest, driest sand you can imagine. Put your mouth on that sand and go. <laughs> and if any of you have ever done SCBA training where they turn your SCBA mask completely off, you run out of air, and your SCBA face piece goes. 
There's literally nothing going in. That's what was laying in the floor. And you can feel all this concrete. What was what, what, what it was? This concrete. It chokes the glass. It chokes the steel flying in the air. And you can feel it in your mouth. It feels like you're chewing on rocks. As you're lying there trying to breathe, you can't breathe. Nothing at all. You've got all of this going on in your mouth. And as you're lying there, you're feeling all this debris is bombarding you. It feels like you feel like someone's shooting you in the back of the building because all that glass, all that does, all the chunks of concrete, everything is just blasting you in your back while you're laying there. It's painful. In fact, it was the same left. Eyebrows, chin, neck, back of the neck. Anything that was exposed got sandblasted like like carpet burn. I was I was breathing. Very painful to lay there. And I'm laying there thinking, I did, I'm done, this is it. I'm done. Suddenly, I see a flicker of light on the corner of my eye. I'm laying there thinking I'm dead.
what do you call that? Not a harbor. What do you call it? A, uh, what do you call that? There was a little area back here. Water, I don't really see it. It's not a good picture, but there's an area of water back there. Uh, Marina, I guess you call it, behind the World Financial Center. And I went back there and I sat down overlooking the, um, the Hudson River and I wept and cried like a baby. And I looked down and I saw my hands doing this. I have no idea how long they did like that. I may have been right there for the last two hours and didn't even know it. I was in a state of shock. I captured. I just witnessed over 3,000 people being killed. <clears throat> and if any of you have been in combat, military, first of all, I'm not taking anything away from our American military. These guys are amazing. These guys are trained for combat. I'm a civilian. I'm not trained for combat. I'm trained to fight fires, right? If I see anybody die from the fire ground, one person dies here, one person dies there. It's not mass destruction and thousands of people to die. My brain was not trained for this. In the military, for the most part, not again, I'm not trying to take away from the military, military people are A, trained in combat, B, they're trained in how to respond to combat as far as you are equipped with an M16, you're authorized to fight back. So if I'm in combat, and I'm under fire, I know, at least I can imagine, I've never been in the military, but I can imagine if I'm taking fire from over there, I know that my enemy is over there. Because I can see his muzzle flashes. I can see his green tracers. My enemy is over there. And I know who my enemy is. On this day, we did not know he was doing this. All we knew was that America was under attack. So A, we didn't know who our enemy was at the time. B, we did not know where the next thing was going to come from. Even while we're on top of the rubble pile, we're thinking there's going to be another kamikaze plane right on top of us. Or another boat could collapse while we're on top of this pile. We, did, we could say our enemy is over there. We could have been the woods. And we definitely did not have anything to fight back with. We're just civilians. Defenseless. I had a mental snap. I was picked up by a voluntary ambulance company, myself and about five other firefighters who were taken to what at the time was called Beekman Street Hospital, across the street from FDY Engine Company State on Beekman Street. Go inside the hospital, hundreds of people laying in this hospital. Everything was taken, bodies laying in the floor, blood everywhere. Debris. Dust everywhere. Even the hospital itself was chaotic. Let's take 10 minutes. What time is it, Jeremy? Okay. We've been, oh, did the last time I this? We returned to the World Trade Center pile that afternoon after being released from the hospital. And this is some of the stuff that we saw. I'm going to speak about 10 more minutes and we're done, folks. I do apologize for keeping me out this way. This is some of the stuff we saw. Fire trucks, police cars, trash, anything, everything that was inside that building being crushed, covered with dust, on fire, or a combination thereof. Those are the ambulances that John Cirillo and I searched as we were heading south of West Street looking for Armand Arena. Fire Company 113, completely gutted. I had been in that truck before. They were in the same battalion with me when I was in the engine. That was sad to see that truck pulled fire on the afternoon of the 11th. Things were completely destroyed. People's lives were completely destroyed. It wasn't just set of buildings. It was I know that in fact seven control all seven World Trade Center towers were destroyed. Excuse me, said World Trade Center buildings were destroyed, and numerous neighboring buildings were also destroyed. There was destruction everywhere. This is a picture of all the destruction that was down under the World Trade Center in uh, the uh, subway tubes. That is the um, 
That is the crossover pedestrian walkway which, under which we found our monitor arena. We had been fighting the uh, motorcycle fire in the uh, South Tower game El Papo. And uh, there's more destruction. A lot of this stuff you've seen on the internet. I'm just showing you some first hand accounts of it. And today I'm doing a lot. I'm a lot of new well. I'm back in North Carolina with my family. I'm a member of Box 1971. I resumed my paramedic career. And aside from teaching, I'm not that much involved in fire service anymore. I prefer to teach now as opposed to riding the big red truck. So in in closing, I will say be prepared, train for the worst, expect the worst, respond to the worst appropriately, never believe it cannot happen to you. Oh, this is a small town. It is not like that. It never happened here. It can. We're a small town. We will never respond to an incident which so many people killed. You can. We're a small town. We're a small fire department. We'll never experience a large number of firefighter fatalities. It can. You can. Be prepared for it mentally. The while we're along, but the while we're along up those lines talking about mental health, for 20 years I've dealt with the horrors that I've seen. Many sleepless nights. Many, many nights spent with a bottle in my head. So if you have anyone who you suspect, or even if you don't suspect it, who may have some type of thing going on in their life, watch out for them. We're, we're all trained intelligent adults in here. Look for the signs of mental illness. Look for the signs of stress. Suicide right now, depression, alcoholism, drug abuse, divorce, Suicide is big in the American Fire Service. So, in closing, I ask you look out for yourselves, look out for your brothers, look out for your physical health, your spiritual health, your mental health. Don't leave people hanging. In. And finally, thank you for your time and allowing. Thank you for allowing me to be here to you today. Have a good night.